Hello students, welcome to this lecture on species concepts. So this is actually a really interesting topic to try to figure out how do we discriminate one species from another. Of course, I'm an entomologist and so there are so many species. There are more spe described species of insects than any other animal on the planet. And, and it's such an interesting topic to try to figure out what is one species and what is another species. To further along this, we're going to look at um, some flowers for a little bit. So look at these six, these five flowers. How many species are here? What do you think? Are they all five different or maybe are a couple of them the same species? Well, how do we, how do we determine this? Well, this is the point of this, of part of this lecture is that there are multiple ways to determine this. And so what I'm going to do is present you with different evidences and then we'll talk about what types of species concepts might help define how many species of flowers there are. So first look at this graph of the average flower size of each group. As you can see that the flower A, B, C, D, and E all have different flower sizes. Right? Flower A, for example, is averaged right around 15. Flower B is averaged right around 7 and so forth. So there are different sizes. Well, if they're different sized flowers, isn't that enough evidence then to suggest that maybe they're different species? Well, potentially. And under what we call the morphological species concept, it perhaps might be enough evidence to deem each of those flowers a different species or to define them as different species. So when we use the morphological species concept, it's based on these differences and similarities that we can see in the organism, right? Their morphology. The advantages of this concept is that it can be widely applicable to most forms of life, including forms that have already gone extinct. So we can actually take a fossil, right? A rock that has an impression or somehow has fossilized uh, the morphology of the organism and we can use that also to define uh, what species it is, if it's a new species, and so forth. The disadvantages, though, are that definitions tend to be arbitrary and authoritative, and sometimes there are organisms that don't have any morphological variation. For example, these nematodes, these roundworms, they all pretty much are a tube with a mouth and an anus, and that's about it. So there's not a lot of morphology in the first place to use to differ differentiate species. Sometimes species are cryptic, and so they're hard to find, like this frog. Maybe you've never seen it before. If you can't see it, you can't then determine if it's a different species from something else. Sometimes there are sexual dimorphisms that occur, like in the, this spider species. The male is much smaller than the female. And so if you were to see both of these side by side and not know that one was male and one was female, you might say those are both two different species, but you would be wrong. And then there's the issue of polymorphism, where one species can have lots of different types. So as you look at these butterflies, how many species do you think are there? Well, it turns out that there's actually only two species. This entire left column is one species, and it has those seven different morph types. And the other column on the right-hand side is a different species that, all ha that also has seven different morph types that basically mimic the, other s the seven morph types of the other species. So the morphological species concept is good and it can work in many circumstances, but it also has disadvantages. So here's a separate um, uh, evidence for these five flowers that we're looking at. These five flowers are pollinated by these species. The flower C is only pollinated by bees. Flowers B and D are pollinated by butterflies. And, and flowers A and E are pollinated by hummingbirds. So if if flowers C get pollinated by bees and never the bees are never going to go visit B, D, A, or E, then we can also think about C being its own species because genetically it's never going to interbreed or it's never going to mix with the other um, flowers, right? This type of species concept is called the biological species concept. It was derived by Ernst Meyer in 1942 and the major criteria of this concept is that you have reproductive isolation. And if you can define and, and describe that reproductive isolation like we just did in that example of the pollinators, then you can therefore define what would be potential species boundaries. 
I like how he says, species are groups of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations that are re reproductively isolated from other such groups. The advantages of the biological species concept is that the criteria is appropriate because it confirms the lack of gene flow. And if you have the lack of gene flow, over t even if it's just, it just happened, over time they will eventually become separate species. The disadvantages, of course, is that it's difficult to put into play operationally. Now maybe with those pollinators it was easy to see bees going to only the, the bee t flower type. But this is really hard to put into play, like if you're out in the rainforest and you're trying to decide, are these fruit flies all one species or are these different species, because it's just hard to get around and track them all. Also, another disadvantage is that the biological species concept can only apply to sexually reproducing populations and contemporary populations. So things like bacteria or things that reproduce asexually would not be able to be defined as different species under this concept and we can't deal with things like fossils. There's also this problem of potentially interbreeding populations, so there, it's not black, entirely black and white. Um, how much reproductive isolation is necessary, how much gene flow is too much, what about hybridizations, etc. So here's a third piece of evidence that potentially you could use to discriminate these species of flowers. Let's say you collect samples of leaf tissue from each individual, from individuals of each population, and then you go in and you sequence a portion of the DNA. So we can go in and actually read the DNA code from a particular um, portion of the DNA, and you find the that this is the DNA code for each of the five flowers. Now you look at that first position, and they all have A's. In the second position, they all have T's. But in the third position, they all have G's except for C and we can continue to, to work our way down the DNA sequence and essentially we can use those same, same types of strategies that we did when we reconstructed a tree because a DNA sequence essentially can become a matrix, a, D, a, a, morpho, a matrix that can be used to then infer the phylogenetic relationships of organisms. And so this brings us to another spe, uh, species concept, the phylogenetic species concept where they say the smallest monophyletic group, the group that where you're all part of the same branch, descendant from one common ancestor, and that possess diagnosable characteristics, which can be DNA sequences, but they also could be morphological, behavioral, or a bunch of other things. So in order to be called a phylogenetic species, populations must have been evolutionary independent long enough for those traits to unite those groups, right, as we go through the, the process of making trees, if there's enough traits to group, to group organisms together, individuals together, then, then we can then refer to that as a species. Uh, uh, one example of this is looking again at this tree over here. And so you basically need to say, well, maybe we're going to call C and D a species, and maybe we're going to call F, G, and G a species. And so there's still some some not, again, it's not entirely black and white in where you would draw your circles and what would become a species. One example of this is actually elephants. It turns out that you have three distinct populations of elephants, the Asians, the African um, forest elephants, and the African savanna elephants. And there was this controversy about whether the African savanna and forest elephants were one species or two distinct species. And so someone did a phylogenetic analysis, and it turns out that all of the forest elephants did indeed group together in one branch on the tree, and all of the savanna elephants did indeed group together in another branch on the tree. So this is good evidence to support that there are three species of elephants currently living on the planet. The advantages then of the phy phylogenetic species concept is that it's applicable to any type of organism, sexual, asexual, you know, alive, or it could be a fossil. You can even take into account morphology in a phylogenetic species concept. It's very testable and quantitative, and it provides a very good classification for us to then um, also uh, use, um, right, as, as the tree can, can represent that classification of the organisms. The disadvantages, though, are that it's still somewhat arbitrary. Putting it into practice can be complicated, expensive, and time-consuming, and phylogenies can change as you, as you get more data at, or taxa. And um, it tends to increase the number of species, but I say, you know, so what? Who cares? We can handle that. I mean, we're, we're not opposed to more pages that Google can search through, so why not more species?
The fourth piece of, it, piece of evidence that we could look at, for example, might be the geographic location. And so if you carefully map all of the different species, you might see that on this island, species, the, flower, uh, the flower type A all occurred over in this area of the island, flower type B over in this area, and C, D, and E. Well, if these things are geographically disju disjunct, and perhaps, you know, there's large mountain ranges that, that divide these things and, and so forth. And there might be other, other types of um, ecological um, factors that are dividing these, these populations. Maybe, maybe one of these flowers lives in a much more wet environment or a much more cool environment or so forth. Well, these types of evidences can lead to what's called the ecological species concept, where we define um, species by the particular set of resources, food, water, space, nutrients, shelter, mates, all of the things that might be part of their environment. Now, some species may change their habitat, so this is a disadvantage for the ecological species concept because over the course of their lifetime, lifetime they might be moving around or even developmentally. Think about like a frog. A frog could is a tadpole, but then it becomes terrestrial, so it's aquatic to terrestrial. Um, also, some ecological niches tend to overlap so that two species are essentially using the same niche. So this causes problems when you're trying to define species. And also, sometimes the niche that, specif that species fills is dependent upon what competing species are present in the environment. And so it may change if those species are absent or present. So the each ecological species concept has some value there as well, but there's also some definite disadvantages. Um, and as you might guess at this point, the best approach is to use all of the possible information that you have and potentially use multiple species concepts and try to come up with a consensus view of what multiple, of, of how many species there are. And that's what we might do, you know, in the case of the, these flowers, right? So um, there's no one concept that perhaps is the best concept in all cases. Uh, the most common concepts that are being used are the biological species concept and the phylogenetic species concept, but that doesn't mean that other concepts also don't have value and might not um, also inform in a particular situation.